Good afternoon. Welcome to today's edition of The Coal Scene. I'm Chris Hamilton, and I'll be your host for the next half hour. Today, I'm going to be joined by Mr. Jason Bostic, who's the Senior Vice President of the West Virginia Coal Association. Jason uh, deals and coordinates all the technical and environmental issues for the association and its uh, member companies. Uh, recently, we have uh, seen a number of, of uh, air policy issues come out of Washington, D.C., uh, primarily uh, from President Obama's <laughs> desk and the current uh, EPA. And these rules have had a, uh, just a, a, a devastating impact on West Virginia's mining industry. Uh, as a result, we've seen uh, literally thousands of miners uh, <clears throat> out of work today. Uh, and to make matters worse, uh, we have seen several of our coal-fired utilities uh, that's been forced to close or their closure has been announced as a result of a, of a uh, national mercury rule and, of course, the, the president's uh, clean power rule. Uh, Jason, thanks so much for taking time to come by today to, to uh, uh, update us uh, on, on these uh, developments and, and their, their impact on, on West Virginia. Appreciate the invitation, Chris. Always glad to be here. You heard uh, sort of the introduction. Uh, we, you know, we're sitting here today, and, and I'm not sure people really realize uh, how negative the consequences are uh, from these uh, directly uh, associated from these uh, two uh, major uh, air quality or air uh, rules that have come out of EPA. Yeah, Chris, the, the devastating actually, and probably the mercury rule was the easiest place to start because the market disruption, uh, particularly to the coal fields of West Virginia and primarily southern West Virginia, is a result of the, what we call the Mercury Mact Rule, which had a massive reshaping of the domestic coal market here in this country. Um, and prior to the, the recently proposed clean power plan, there's some slides that are being flashed on your screen there. That was the most expensive regulation to date ever proposed in U.S. history. And what it caused is the closure of about 400 coal-fired units in 36 states. We lost 18 units at six plants here in the state of West Virginia. And the mercury rule really reshaped the coal market going forward uh, in the, for domestic thermal supply, uh, for, for power generation, and also for non-utility consumption at things like pulp mills, paper mills, and chemical plants. Um, prior to the mercury rule here in West Virginia, we consumed in-state about 9 million tons of coal and industrial facilities that used either the steam or the heat to, for an industrial process. Mercury, the mercury rule required all of those facilities to convert to natural gas. So that market has essentially been lost. And the power plants that remain operating in, in the U.S are scrubbed plants to comply with the mercury rule. So you, there is no more incentive to burn low sulfur southern West Virginia or central Appalachian coal. So, so, so the niche that southern West Virginia coal hell has held for so many years since probably the early 90s or the enactment <coughs> of the acid rain mm -hmm provisions to the Clean Air Act is, has all but disappeared as a result of these these rules and other actions of uh, EPA. It has, Chris. And right now, you know, since the low sulfur premium on central Appalachian, southern West Virginia coal is gone, at the same time Mercury MACT was having that impact on the market, on the consumption side, we had EPA's actions in the mine permitting side of things mm -hmm. that drove up the cost to operate in southern West Virginia dramatically. So southern West Virginia steam coal is priced out of the market at this point. We are losing that share of generation to coal from other basins or to natural gas because production costs in southern West Virginia are so high. Now I've heard, you know, and I'm aware that uh, you know, a lot of our res remaining reserve base uh, carries with it a, a higher cost. It's a little deeper uh, on the surface. You have greater ratios. Uh, it's a little more, you know, strategically uh, difficult to to access. That obviously adds a little cost, but it's truly minuscule compared to 
what the compliance cost of the mercury mat rule uh, Absolutely. Is, is today. Yeah, because I mean, you know, the, the, we are, the coal business is full of smart people and there have always been geological challenges, not only in southern West Virginia, but all th throughout Appalachia. So a declining, more fractured, smaller reserve base is often pointed to by EPA and members of the media to say, well, this was inevitable. The decline in coal production mm -hmm. in West Virginia was going to happen anyway. And I, I don't believe that. I think uh, we as mining engineers, professional coal miners, have always overcome those challenges and we still can. And West Virginia coal is still the best bang for the buck in terms of if you have to move a ton of material to make a BTU, you still get the most value from West Virginia. Mm -hmm. The actions of the government have driven the costs up. It's not geology. It's not issues related to the to the uh, remaining intrinsic reserve base. Okay. It's regulatory interference. Okay. You you have some slides we're gonna we're gonna walk through to, to delineate some of the the different parts and aspects of the of these rules. Yes, I understand. Sir. Yeah, if we could bring the slides up there, yes. um, Chris. Just to, to revisit a little bit more on Mercury Mac, mm -hmm. to, so the audience understands a little better. This rule, which has had such a devastating impact, not only on southern West Virginia coal production, but on the electric utility side of this industry. Um, just, just so the folks understand, mercury, a lot like carbon, is a, what's referred to as a global constituent. Discharge, the mercury, the concentration that may be in the air may not necessarily have come from the power plant that's down the street. It most likely came, just to, it, it, it probably came from China, almost as assuredly as it came from the power plant down the street. I was going. I was uh, reading a little bit about this before uh, before the show today. Just wanted to know a little bit more about the the subject matter, and uh, I believe I read where the percentage uh, generated by all of our coal fired utilities was was less than one percent of right. global uh, emissions. It's it's remarkable that that percentage is so so low, but yet this rule, uh, you know, aims at reducing half or three quarters of that at a it's such a cost on our on our economy and, and and you and I and everybody pays for it Yeah, an absolutely remarkable cost Chris and not only that but the destabilization of the grid one of the things that we're going to get into here in one of the one of the slides subsequent slides is the loss of potential generating capacity because of the mercury power plant closures um, and during the extremely cold winter uh, two years ago all of the plants that have now been closed as a result of the mercury rule were run at full capacity to keep the grid stable because the electric demand across the country was so high. Wow. Now that mercury, the mercury rule is in full effect, well it was before the Supreme Court overturned it, mm -hmm. those plants are closed and for the most part they're going to remain closed. They're gone forever. So if, if you'll look there just to give you an idea of the slide on the screen, you can see the West Virginia electrical generation that was lost to the mercury rule and we lost somewhere around 3,000 megawatts of generating capacity just within the state of West Virginia at the six power plants that were closed as a result of that, that rule. And below the, uh, the chart there, you can see the, the impact to coal production or coal consumption in West Virginia. This is just in-state coal consumption. And we dropped from potential in-state coal consumption of 27 million tons to about 16 million tons. Not only is that the loss of the six utility electric power generators, that's also the loss of nine million tons of industrial non-steel consumption at chemical plants and manufacturing facilities. We often talk about the coal jobs that have been lost and the effects of a smaller amount of coal severance dollars that's available for our counties to run governments and programs. Uh, we, we, we forget about the utility workers and the truck drivers and the rail workers whose jobs have also been, been impacted. In the case of losing six in-state coal-fired utilities, you know, each having multiple units, uh, there, there's been a, you know, several thousand utility workers that, whose jobs have been displaced. Absolutely, Chris, and, and a loss of some of the, uh, the loss of power plants across the country because of Mercury Mac. The, the two instances that stick most in my mind to illustrate the multiplier effect of the coal uh, industry and the, the coal burning electric utility industry are the layoffs announced by CSX Transportation in Norfolk Southern, our two class one in-state railroads. Mm -hmm. 
that relied heavily on the movement of coal from West Virginia to southern utilities. And a lot of those utilities were closed because of Mercury Act or the Mercury Rule. And that we have now lost that market. The railroads have now lost that freight business. Well, and those <coughs> utilities serve as economic engines within those communities. Absolutely. I mean, it's a major industrial facility. There's several hundred people that are employed there. And, you know, there's a gas station, convenience store, little restaurant uh, that typically surrounds these uh, these uh, these stations, power mm -hmm. stations, and, yeah. and and their loss as well. Yeah, I mean the the Canal River Glasgow plant, not very far from here at the state capital, up the road. Um, the typical small West Virginia community, and it was largely dependent on the operation of the Canal River power plant, and that was the that little community's tax base. Um, mm -hmm. And the the coal truck drivers and the the guys that operated the the coal handling facility at that plant constituted a large part of the eastern Kanawha County economy. Uh, well, I tell you all, that's amazing. But, and that's, a, that's all due to the Mercury Mac rule that we're, yes. we're talking about at this point. Yeah, everything that's happened so far, the job losses across Appalachia, mm -hmm. um, whether it be coal mines, utilities, or the railroads or the coal truck uh, drivers, is all related to merc the mercury rule. None of this, none of the potential impact of the clean power, what, what the president calls the clean power plan, the carbon control regulations has, has been felt yet. Um, and we think that as bad as the mercury rule has been for West Virginia, the clean power plan, the carbon rule, will be so much worse, not only for the state of West Virginia, but for the entire country. Mm. Um, you know, I don't know how much the audience wants to know about the technical details, but the Clean Power Plan, the Carbon Rule, proposes to reduce emissions 32 percent from 2005 levels by 2030. And the average cost of electricity across this country is going to raise by 15 percent. But probably the most, the, the most concerning thing to me when I look at this rule is the fact that this is reshaping this nation's electrical system, which has been the envy of the rest of the world because of its simplicity. That power generation dispatched according to cost. The low cost source of electrical generation was always dispatched first, followed by the by successive more expensive sources to meet demand. The carbon rule will require power to be dispatched according to its carbon content. And that's a fundamental reshape of how this nation's electrical system has worked. Um, I think we, we have some other slides that get into some of the uh, effects of the of the president's uh, clean power rule. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm a, I'm truly amazed every time I hear of this rule. It occurs to me that uh, you know all this all this uh, uh, impact that's occurring and the consequences on our economy, our jobs uh, are you know a, a huge component of our industrial base is all over uh, EPA insisting that we deal with less than 1% of world's uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, this has nothing to do with, with health issues or the reduction of those constituents of, uh, you know, of, the, of the emission stream uh, that deal with public health. You're I absolutely mean, right. There's other programs. There's been other amendments to the Clean Air Act that's been specifically aimed at those reductions. Absolutely, and this like the, the massive reshape of the electric grid, driving retail prices of electricity for the consumer through the roof, driving energy intensive and electrical intensive manufacturing facilities offshore. And EPA, and to some degree the president himself, have admitted that this is a meaningless exercise. You could turn off every coal-fired power plant in the United States of America and have absolutely no impact on world carbon emissions because there is no commitment from developing countries, not only developing countries, but certain countries in Europe that tried a re renewable alternative energy path with added nuclear capacity. They tried that system and it failed miserably, and they turned back to older coal-fired generation. So it, it, a lot like the Mercury Rule, this is an enormous amount of cost. This is the potential reshaping of this country's entire economy for absolutely no benefit at all. Uh, <clears throat> I have said before that I hear the president uh, on occasion saying that the United States ought to provide leadership on this issue. And you know, over the past 30, 40 years now, since the mid-70s, 
or since the enactment of the Clean Air Act, uh, our, our uh, EPA has, has imposed uh, air quality requirement after requirement on our fleet of, of coal-fired utilities. And a lot of those requirements uh, had a rational basis, were well intended, and served to, to clean up the emission stream from coal-fired utilities. I believe that the, while we've increased, uh, doubled, or even tripled our, the amount of coal being consumed, uh, airborne emissions of all types have been reduced uh, on the order of magnitude of uh, you know, north of 95%. Yes, sir. And, and yeah, Christopher, in reference to your earlier point about the president and his EPA selling the clean power plan, the carbon rules having health benefits, that's somewhat of doublespeak because, as you mentioned, the Clean Air Act has specific provisions that deal with what we what are referred to as constituent pollutants, like mm -hmm. lead, like sulfur dioxide. So the legal, congressionally enacted parts of the Clean Air Act deal with those constituents. For the president to sell the carbon rules dealing with that, that's really doublespeak. Well, and to the previous point about providing leadership, you know, we, we talk about all these, uh, uh, all these controls and the hundreds of billions of dollars uh, that, that have been invested in clean coal technologies that's employed, deployed, and utilized today. Uh, you know, we, we have not seen any of our foreign countries that happen to use a lot more coal than, than what we do, we've not seen them put on the first uh, after-treatment device. They have not followed the leadership that we have been providing as a country and as a state for 30, 40 years. That's absolutely right. I mean, it's bizarre to think they're going to follow our lead in destroying our economic base and such a huge uh, component of our, of our industrial base. Uh, for such little benefit. They're not going to follow our lead. They're not. They're going to steal our <coughs> markets. Exactly. And if countries like China and India won't do things as simple as burning coal more efficiently so that you have a cleaner emission or installing sulfur dioxide removal technology so that you remove the potential for, for acid rain, they're certainly not going to follow on with something as, as expensive and as unproven as carbon sequestration from a power plant stack. You know the other point, and I had the uh, I had the experience of uh, of going to China uh, several years ago and visiting uh, some of their uh, industrialized uh, regions, and uh, we we came we were visiting a coal to liquids plant, and actually I was with Governor Manchin at the time, who who inquired about uh, what was going on with the uh, with the carbon uh, emissions. And, you know, we were told, frankly, that nothing was going on. They were not controlling. They were not uh, sequestering in any way, shape, or form. And the individual operating the plant, and he was very Americanized. And, you know, he said something that to this day, it's, it's just it resonated and has stuck with me. He says, you know, he says, we're, we're a big part of our country is still third world. He says, we have 20, 25% of our people without electricity. I mean, this is China. And he said, before we put on after treatment devices on these public utilities, it weren't public utilities, but uh, that, that consume large amounts of power themselves, he says, we feel a higher obligation for the overall health of our people and country to try to get a light bulb in every province before we start using the limited electricity we have on after treatment devices. Yeah, uh, and uh, Chris, that's one of the things that, that disturbs me again about the carbon rule. There are assumptions built in what EPA has published and proposed here about the carbon footprint of the nation's electrical system after this major rule, and there are assumptions that the increased cost of electricity will drive down consumption. That's one of EPA's motivators and justifications. So for the first time since our history, since this nation was electrified, if you will, then consumers will have to make a choice about running their television, running their computer, and saving for their medication and for their food. It's a, it's it's just it's it's very tough to believe. So they so they admit that on a per unit basis, electricity is going to cost us a lot more, but the rationale is that we're going to be forced to use 
less of it. Because it costs so much. Because more. it costs so much. Yeah, and one of the other, the things that has not been quantified to date, Chris, is the fact that the way the rule structured, states like West Virginia that are very coal dependent for their electrical generation. And, and by the way, just so everyone knows, uh, what 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 amount of of carbon or cr greenhouse gas emissions is, is the state of West Virginia going to be compelled to? Uh, you know, what's the target there? How much lower? We have to be 23% below 2005 levels of carbon emissions in the state of West Virginia. And because of the nature of our system here in West Virginia, we think the, we and the state regulators at this point think the only way you can achieve a 23% reduction is to shutter about half of the remaining coal-fired capacity in the state of West Virginia. And that's part of EPA's assumption here is that you can close coal-fired capacity and obtain electricity from renewable sources. But what that's going to require is an elaborate trading system where you move green megawatts from the state of California, for example, or Texas where solar is viable across the country to West Virginia. That's an additional added cost beyond the light switch. So EPA anticipates a 15% increase in electrical bills when in reality I think it could be as high as 35 to 45% as coal dependent states like West Virginia have to look to outside sources for their power. Isn't it true that we will also uh, be subjected to a, to a second layer of reductions when all the states that we ship coal to also begin complying with their reduced standard? Absolutely. So, I mean, the majority of West Virginia's coal moves outside of our borders to power plants in other states. Each one of those states faces its own steep hurdle on carbon reduction. So you're not only going to lose generating capacity in West Virginia, as coal miners and coal marketers, we are going to lose generation to North Carolina, Florida, Michigan, and the other states that we ship coal to. I tell you, this discussion just highlights so many, uh, so many flaws uh, with, this, with, this, uh, with this plan. And it also highlight, highlights some things that have just real uh, border borderline ludicrous uh, uh, results. Again, uh, you know, I read the other day where where uh, China and India and that portion of the world uses six or seven times more coal today than we do. They emit more greenhouse gas uh, into the atmosphere and CO2 on a monthly basis than this rule aims to to reduce in a month uh, and or uh, over the course of a year rather and and with world use of coal on the incline you know one could logically conclude that despite our efforts here the best results that we're able to achieve world greenhouse gas emissions are going to continue to go upward. Absolutely, Chris, and I think we also face the possibility that as you drive heavy en energy intensive manufacturing, aluminum smelting, steel making further offshore, that you're actually going to quadruple, triple quadruple carbon emissions because as we mentioned earlier, coal isn't burned as efficiently in China and India as it is here in the U.S. I mean, their coal burners are, are, are not even efficient enough to achieve a reduced emissions from the combustion of the coal at the boiler. Plus, they don't have <coughs> the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, you know, on the, on the accountability and compliance side of things that, you know, is preparing to drop nets on people here. I mean, there's nothing like that agency that, that uh, you'll find in these other countries as well. That's absolutely right. In the alphabet soup of other agencies, MSHA, the mm -hmm. Office of Surface Mining, the Department of Environmental Protection, that is unheard of in these countries because like you said, they're worried about growing their economy and if you have to burn coal to do that, they're prepared to do that, as we in this country once were. The legislature earlier this year passed legislation that subjects our future plans, compliance plans that are developed uh, to legislative approval before, before they take effect or are submitted to, to EPA. Uh, kind of reminds me uh, of the uh, process that the U.S. Senate uh, established for the Kyoto Protocol 
uh, 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Where well, they really <clears throat> blocked that from yeah. uh, from being, you know, an actual uh, uh, effective uh, uh, instrument. Yeah, very very similar concept, Chris, and very similar concern because the clean power plan is so far reaching beyond what our Department of Environmental Protection here.